Okay, let's dive in to T.S. Eliot and the Wasteland. And I'm sure when you finished reading <laughs> this long poem, you were like, what the heck? So I want to try to break it down for you a little bit, maybe give you some insight so that you can appreciate what's actually going on um, in this particular poem. So T.S. Eliot um, was like Pound and um, Stein, an, ex, an American expatriate. So he left the American Midwest and moved um, to um, Europe as well and spent some time in London and there he, um, out, outside of the United States, he did, he wrote The Wasteland and, and most everything else. Um, he was very encouraged by Pound. Pound was instrumental in his writing and in his life. Um, he also, not only did Pound support him artistically, but often he supported him financially as well. Um, he began writing The Wasteland in 1921, and he finished it while recovering from a mental breakdown. Many people claim it was actually jointly authored because of Pound's heavy editorial hand. But in any case, T.S. Eliot is solely credited for um, writing of the writing of The Wasteland. Um, the poem's title gives us a view of modern civilization after the war, after World War I, and the disillusionment that it created, which is what we've been talking about for the last several weeks. Um, ironically, a war fought to save civilization was marked by unmatched brutality and destruction. So in this particular poem, as with in the other uh, modernist works we've looked at, there is that sense of trying to make sense of, of a new type of world. And what you get in this poem is a lot of fragments, um, again. So the wasteland ex itself, as you, as you realized, was, is composed of five sections. But these five sections are seemingly unrelated, except that some characters do pop up from one section to another. And the sections themselves are fragments with multiple voices and multiple characters. So what's really going on then with the, within the structure of the wasteland um, and how Eliot is putting together as well as some of the things that are said and the thematic content, um, that the poem is really lamenting a loss of connectedness, um, a loss of connectedness to a past that made sense and a loss of connect connectedness between people. So that this type of fragmentation um, is also evident in a person's alienation from the larger world and from people's alienation or lack of connectedness to each other. Um, perhaps, though, um, Eliot is suggesting that reconnection is possible in some new way, not in a traditional way by any stretch. And so I guess the question that I want to leave you with is, is there hope in the wasteland? Um, so let's um, just dig right in and start with the burial of the dead. It is important to know that the footnotes are an extension of the poem. So um, if you didn't read the footnotes um, the first time around, go back as we're going through and pause me when you need to to catch up on those footnotes because it really does illuminate and give you some other ideas about to bring to bear on the poem itself. Okay, um, so let's talk about the burial of the dead. So this is the um, beginning section of, of the wasteland and interestingly it begins with the ritual found in the Anglican Book of Common Prayer. Now that's how it begins. If you flip to the end, it ends with um, Hindu, okay, Hindu words from their sacred writings called the Upanishads. So we're beginning with one world religion, Christianity. We're ending with another world religion, Hinduism. There's 
Buddhism mixed in. So Eliot is establishing this overarching sense that every he's he's speaking to everyone here. Um, no one's anything is working. So um, he's he's kind of putting it all all these different fragments of all these different religions together in in hopes to come up with a message for us all. So he begins in those first 18 lines, and this is some of the famous, most famous, um, most famous lines in modern poetry, if not poetry in general. April is the cruelest month, breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire, stirring dull roots with spring rain. Winter kept us warm, covering earth in forgetful snow, feeding a little life with dried tubers. So you get this real sense of these are kind of general ideas, universal ideas um, that, you know, he, here we are um, experiencing similar things. So this is sort of the general. Then we move on to, to where it becomes more specific. We have a specific event. Um, and when we were children, staying at the Archduke's, my cousins. He took me out on a sled, and I was frightened. He said, Marie, Marie, hold on tight, and down we went. In the mountains, there you feel free. I read much of the night and go south in the winter. So we're moving from general to very specific, and in that specific scene, we have multiple voices going on. We have the we as children. We have my cousin, he. We have an I. We have Marie. Um, and so then we have a you and an I. So it's that sense that we've got multiple voices, multiple languages. We're moving from general to specific. And so the question becomes, you know, what is the relationship between the general and the specific? Um, can a common world be created out of private ex experiences? Can we relate to this? Um, can you envision this moment? Can you relate to it? And in other words, if you can relate to this, well, then can we connect to each other? In an increasingly fragmented world, can we connect? So that's how this poem starts. And then if you look down, um, into the next line, starting with 19 through 24, um, you get the wasteland landscape. And notice it starts with, um, you cannot say or guess, for you only know a heap of broken images. Okay, Where the sun beats and the dead tree gives no shelter, the cricket no relief, and the dry stone no sound of water. So this is the wasteland landscape. It's dry. It's fragmented. It is modern culture. Um, and you continue to read, only there is shadow under this red rock. Come in under the shadow of this red rock, and I will show you something different from either your shadow at morning striding behind you or your shadow at evening rising to meet you. I will show you fear in a handful of dust. So again, that sense of I'm going to show you something that is um, that is fearful, that lacks um, any sense of connection. Um, I'm going to show you our world in, in other words. And then we go through several different um, characters that appear. We have the hyacinth girl that appears. And in that section about the hyacinth girl, it says, you gave me hyacinths first a year ago. They called me the hyacinth girl. When, yet when we came back late from the hyacinth garden, your arms full and your hair wet, I could not speak, and my eyes failed. I was neither living nor dead, and I knew nothing. Looking to the, into the heart of light, the silence. So again, who are, who are the you and the we and the me? Again, it's that can the specific be related to the general? Can we connect through each of our own types of stories? Then we get Madame Sesostris, um, the famous clairvoyant. So here we have another character appearing, another person maybe that we're trying to connect to in some type of way. Um, and 
she goes through her pack of tarot cards and she deal, deals images that will come later. The drowned Phoenician sailor, for example, will appear later in the poem. So it's, and as she says, fear death by water. I see crowds of people walking round in a ring. And then later in the poem, there's a whole section called death by water. So um, again, trying to connect through a bunch of different fragments is what Eliot's getting at here. And then in the last paragraph, or this last stanza of the burial of the dead, um, we see the landscape of Metro London. And we get a lot of Im a lot of images here that speak to that sense of alienation again. We see, and each man fixed his eyes before his feet. So that sense that no one is looking around. No one is connecting. They're just walking with their face down. And then there I saw one I knew and stopped him crying, Stetson. Um, and then he asks Stetson, this person he thinks he knew, a bunch of questions. Um, so this Stetson is just describing somebody in a particular type of hat. So it could be anyone. And so the question becomes, you know, how do we find each other? I, there I saw one I knew, and I stopped him. But, and it says, you who are with me in the ships at Malai, which was just where a battle took place. Um, that corpse you planted last year in your garden, has it begun to sprout? Will it bloom this year? Or has the sudden frost disturbed its bed? Oh, keep the dog far hence, that's friend to men. Or with his nails, he'll dig it up again. And so, again, he's just asking these questions like he's talking to a person he knows, where really this person could have been anybody. So, in this section, we get fragments of alienation and that question of how can we connect to one another? Can we connect to one another? Then in a game of chess, um, this section is built around two conversations. We have high and low culture meeting. The first scene takes place in a drawing room. The other scene takes place in a pub. Um, but really, whether it's a high or low culture, the same issues are at play here. Lack of connection, nothingness. In the first scene, the couple in the drawing room, the first paragraph is just describing the room. And then we get this exchange between the, the man and the woman. So again, multiple voices, people trying to connect with one another but missing it. My nerves are bad tonight. Yes, bad. Stay with me. Speak to me. Why do you never speak? Speak. What are you thinking of? What thinking? What? I never know what you're thinking. Think. I think we are in Rat's Alley where the dead men lost their bones. What is that noise? The wind under the door. What is that noise now? What is the wind doing? Nothing. Again, nothing. Do you know nothing? Do you see nothing? Do you remember nothing? I remember. Those are pearls that were his eyes. Are you alive or not? Is there nothing in your head? But, oh, 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 that Shakespearean rag. It's so elegant, so intelligent. What shall I do now? What shall I do? I shall rush out as I am and walk the street with my hair down so. What shall we do tomorrow? What shall we ever do? The hot water at ten, and if it rains, a closed car at four, and we shall play a game of chess, pressing lidless eyes and waiting for a knock upon the door. So here you see they're having a difficult time connecting to one another. Um, the questions and the answers are, are almost disjointed, um, except at the the end when they say what shall we do and basically the answer is well we'll have hot water at 10 if it rains a closed car at 4 we'll play chess waiting for a knock upon the door so they're like waiting internally for something to happen and you get that nothingness very strong the couple clearly is irritated with each other they're doing nothing they can't connect. Um, and then you see 
in the second part of this section, you see a scene take place in a pub. And you almost have to hear these, these lines spoken um, with this woman's Cockney accent, um, which a, a part of that is the words I said, he said, she said, um, after a, a statement that's just part of the dialect. And so you almost kind of have to hear it. I'll try it, but I'm not going to be as successful as somebody that really speaks this dialect, um, this type of English dialect. So there's many people in this bar, but there's really only one speaker because this one woman is relating all of these events. Um, and then the bartender keeps interrupting with, hurry up please, it's time. In other words, it's time to leave and it's time to shut up. Okay. So again, this lack of connectedness to other people. I'm, I'm going to give it a try to see if you can hear it, but you might want to read it out loud for yourself. When Lil's husband got demobbed, I said, I didn't mince my words. I said to her myself, hurry up, please. It's time. Now, Albert's coming back. Make yourself a bit smart. He'll want to know what you've done with that money he gave you to get yourself some teeth. He did. I was there. You have them all out, Lil, and get a nice set, he said. I swear I can't bear to look at you. And no more can't I, I said. And think of poor Albert. He's been in the Army four years. He wants a good time, and if you don't give it him, there's others will, I said. Oh, is there, she said. Something of that, I said. Then I'll know who to thank, she said, and gave me a straight look. So you get, there's a lot of people saying things, but only one voice. Okay, only one voice speaking, and then that interrupting bartender. So again, in that section, we get um, this um, lack of connection of people really able to communicate effectively with, with one another. Um, pause if you want. Um, we're going to move on to the fire sermon, section three. So if you want to take a quick little break, I don't blame you. Um, okay, so let's catch back up. Let's talk about the last couple of sections of the wasteland. So we have the fire sermon. And here you have the note that says that this is Buddha's fire sermon. So we're bringing in Buddhist um, thought here. Um, and it's important to know that some of the main tenor, tenets of Buddhism um, are that self-control is incredibly important, being able to control yourself, and that suffering is transforming. Okay? So those are important ideas um, of Buddhism. In the fire sermon, we get multiple scenes, voices, multiple languages, all kinds of first persons, but no one is connecting with each other. Okay? You will see all of these things all mixed together, lots of people talking, but no one is connecting. Um, so it, and, and in fact, that becomes, I think, very, very apparent um, when, and I didn't list this on the PowerPoint, but if you, if you turn to like two, line 234, you get a quote-unquote love scene that, that is really, really speaks to the lack of connection between these two people, which bespeaks the lack of connection throughout this whole particular um, section of the wasteland. Um, the time is now propitious as he guesses. The meal is ended. She is bored and tired. Endeavors to engage her in caresses which are which still are unreproved if undesired. Flushed and decided he assaults at once. Exploring hands encounter no defense. His vanity requires no response and makes a welcome of indifference. And I, Tiresias, have for suffered all, enacted on this same divan or bed. I, who have sat by Thebes below the wall, and walking among the lowest of the dead, bestows one final patronizing kiss, and gropes his way, finding the stairs unlit. So clearly, this is a very dispassionate scene of lovemaking. The two people are totally unconnected to each other, and they don't care about 
what the other needs. And in the middle of it, you have Tiresias emerging. And Tiresias is, um, if you look down in your note, um, he is the leader, so to speak, or the governor or the guardian of the underworld. Okay, so again, very, very desperate images here. Um, and, if, and, if, and as you go on, you can see the, the woman's response after the man has left. She turns and looks a moment in the glass, hardly aware of her departed lover. Her brain allows one half-formed thought to pass. Well, now that's done, and I'm glad it's over. So you can just see, they're making love, but they're totally disconnected from one another. So it's that same kind of sense. And then, probably a very obvious line in this, in this poem is around 301, 302, where the speaker says, I can connect nothing with nothing. So there you go. That doesn't need much explanation, I don't think. Then let's move to Death by Water. It is the shortest section of the wasteland. And this is where Madame Sesostris Drowned Phoenician Sailor comes back into the poem. And we find out what happened to him. Um, and notice at the very end, um, we get Gentile or Jew. So in other words, regardless of who you are. Consider Phlebas, who was once handsome and tall as you. So in other words, the drowned Phoenician sailor, consider him. Consider what happened. You are no different, right? So again, trying to, to build a common world out of private experiences. Trying to get people to connect to one another, which is what Eliot feels has been lost in this modern world of fragments and fragmentation. How do we get people to reconnect? Is it possible to rebuild a common experience? And then the very final um, section is what the thunder said. And here we get a sermon told by thunder. Um, they're waiting for water that the thunder promises. They're waiting for a speech. We're waiting for hope. We're waiting for something that will bring us out of this wasteland, out of these fragments, and that can connect us. Um, so my question is, do you think there is hope or a promise of redemption um, in, in the wasteland? I want to point out a couple of things. First, da, da, da. Deadvam, Demiata. This appears um, several times on starting about line 401, um, following the line, then spoke the thunder. Um, and we get this very strong statement on 420, 430. These fragments. I have shored against my ruins. Well, what fragments is he talking about? These fragments we've just read, this entire wasteland um, on one hand, and these fragments of this thunder, what the thunder said, the sermon by the thunder, the hope of rain, the promise of rain. And if you look in the notes, he says, I've shored these against my ruins. Okay, these fragments I have shored against my ruins. and I'm, So we look backward at the fragments of the poem, and then we look forward to these fragments um, that come from the Upanishads. And if you can see the translations, it's give, sympathize, and control. So in other words, give to other people. Sympathize, that should be a central value of human life which brings healing, and then control. Remember um, that tenet of Buddhism, that self-control is so, so important, and that suffering is transformative, that all we've, we've gone through has brought us to this new place. So 
it's okay, in other words, that our world has been rocked. Um, through that suffering, we have emerged into a new world where perhaps there is hope. Um, it will never look like the old world, but perhaps we can connect. Perhaps we can assemble the fragments. Or perhaps we can just enjoy the fragments as they are and not try to recreate a world that we never can achieve or recreate. And then he ends almost like saying, okay, if you can do these things, if you can give, sympathize, control what you can control, right, yourself, and be okay in the fragments, be okay in the change, then you will have peace, 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 the Shanti, 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 which again is, is from the Upanishads. So there you go. There's, there's the wasteland, and that's just one particular reading of it in the heavens. There are many, many more, but perhaps um, Eliot is offering us some hope. I, I don't know. Maybe you think that there is no hope in this <laughs> at all, <laughs> but perhaps there is a little bit.